Good day and welcome to our event, Chronopolitics and Knowledge Production in Migration Studies. Before we begin, let me notice that there is captioning available. You can click the button on the lower right hand of the screen. I want to begin with the land acknowledgement. We take a moment to recognize that Berkeley sits on the territory of Huchun, the ancestral and unceded land of the Chochenyo speaking Ohlone people, the, the successors of the historic and sovereign Verona Band of Alameda County. This land was and continues to be of great importance to the Mawekma Ohlone tribe and other familial descendants of the Verona Band. We recognize that every member of the Berkeley community has and continues to benefit from the use and occupation of this land since the institution's founding in 1868. Consistent with our values of community and diversity, we have a responsibility to acknowledge and make visible the university's relationship to native peoples. By offering this land acknowledgement, we affirm indigenous sovereignty and will work to hold the University of California Berkeley more accountable to the needs of American Indian and indigenous peoples. My name is Letty Volk and I'm the director of the Center for Race and Gender at UC Berkeley. Today's event was created by the Center for Race and Gender's Native Immigrant Refugee Crossings Research Initiative and is supported by the Peter Sather Foundation. Many thanks to the foundation for its generous support of research interchange between Norwegian University partners and UC Berkeley. Many thanks as well to our co-sponsors, the Berkeley Interdisciplinary Migration Initiative and the Department of Scandinavian at UC Berkeley. Let me now introduce our presenters for today. Um, after presentations, we will open it up for discussion. Please post any questions or comments to the Q&A button on your screen and we will try to address all of them. We will first hear from Christine M. Jakobsen and Marianne Carlson. Christine Jakobsen is Professor of Social Anthropology at the University of Bergen, where she has served as the Research Director of the Bergen Migration Research Unit and also as Director at the Center for Women's and Gender Research. Christine Jakobsen's research with irregularized migrants in Marseille will soon be published in a book provisionally titled Undocumented Lives in Marseille, Temporality, Gender and Migration. She is also the author of the book, Islamic Traditions and Muslim Youth in Norway and co-editor of a special issue of Feminist Review on Islam and Gender in Europe, Subjectivities, Politics and Piety. Christine had headed a several year project funded by the Research Council of Norway known as Waiting for an Uncertain Future, focusing not on the question of space and immigration but on the question of time which has now resulted in a volume co-edited by Christine and our other presenter, Marianne Carlson, as well as Shahram Kosravi, titled Waiting and the Temporalities of Irregular Migration, recently published by Rutledge. Marianne Carlson is researcher at the Center for Women's and Gender Research at the University of Bergen, uh, with a background in human geography and social anthropology, and with interests in migration, the welfare state, and border politics. We see this in Marianne Carlson's forthcoming book uh, from Rutledge, Migration Control and Access to Welfare, The Precarious Inclusion of Irregular Migrants in Norway, which will be published in June. Uh, Christine now heads and Marianne is involved in the EU finance project Protect, which examines vulnerability and the governance of international protection. After Christine Jakobsen and Marianne Carlson present, we will hear a response from Samra Esmir. Samra Esmir is Associate Professor in Rhetoric at UC Berkeley, whose work lies at the intersection of legal and political thought, Middle Eastern history, and colonial and post-colonial studies. Samra Esmir is the author of the acclaimed book, Juridical Humanity, a colonial history published uh, uh, by Stanford, and is currently working on a book project examining the encounter between revolutions and different legal traditions. She is also working on a number of essays that focus on Palestine as a site for rethinking concepts central to legal and political thought. Samra Ismir is also editor of the journal Critical Times, uh, Interventions in Global Critical Theory, 
and co-director of the International Consortium of Critical Theory Programs. So without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to Christine and Marianne. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Letty, for inviting us to this uh, seminar and Samira for agreeing to be our discussion. Um, we want to share with you some reflections on knowledge production that emerged um, from our work in the project WAIT, or Waiting for Uncertain Future, the Temporalities of Irregular Migration. And I'm going to try to share my screens. Um, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, the WAIT project used theories of a temporality as tools for producing new and critical insights into the cultural conditions and implications of migration. It explored the condition of prolonged waiting, uncertainty and temporariness, which is characteristic of so-called irregular migration. We are aware the terminology in this field is contested and the term irregular migration can be criticized among other things for adopting a tight at stake perspective of categorization. We discuss the challenges of conceptualization more extensively elsewhere, but would like to stress that when using the term here, it is with mindfulness of the processes through which migrant irregularity is produced within shifting national and international migration regimes. In the WAIT project, researchers investigated how temporal structures related to irregularized migration are shaped by legal regimes cultural norms and power relationships, and how they sh shape subject subjective experiences and life projects, among other through ethnographic fieldwork in four European migration hubs, that is Oslo, Norway, Stockholm, Sweden, Marseille, France, and Hamburg, Germany. And results from the, book, the project, uh, as Letty mentioned, recently came out in the shape of um, the volume waiting and temporalities of irregular migration that Christine and I edited with Sharam Koshrani uh, and published at Rutledge. The book uh, proposes ways to develop waiting as an analytical lens in migration studies through conceptualizing waiting as constitu constituted in and through multiple and relational temporalities and through highlighting the significance of the geopolitical and chronopolitical locations of waiting. The WAIT project can be situated within what is arguably a recent temporal turn in migration studies, which has foregrounded the temporal dynamics of migration processes, uh, experiences, and governance. In studies of irregular migrants, refugees, and asylum seekers, the temporal category of waiting has become a major theme, with research highlighting both quotidian forms of waiting, such as waiting for public services and bureaucratic decisions, and more prolonged and existential forms of waiting. Ethnographic studies have forcefully documented how these categories of migrants experience that their lives are stuck or put on hold and often conceptualize this experience in terms of limbo or liminality. With the increased interest in exploring migration as a temporal phenomenon, migration scholars have also begun questioning the temporal assumptions that inform migration scholarship. Scrutinizing various temporal frames or chronotopes of migration scholarship Aisha Chagler and Georgina Ramsey have both criticized a tendency to place migrants in a different temporal reality from non-migrants. Echoing Johannes Fabian's seminal critique of other, othering, Chagler argues that placing migrants and natives in different conceptual frame is an a priori categorical denial of coevalness that puts them into distinct and asymmetrical landscape of sociability. This denial of coevalness, she argues, and I quote, disregards the experiences, norms, and values migrants and the natives share, resulting from their contemporary embeddedness in social, economic, and political processes, 
networks, movement, and institutions that exist both within and across state borders at a particular space and time." End of quote. Chagla focuses on integrationist and post-migrant frameworks, showing how these situate migrants present in relation to a normative future or to a past creating path dependency. In a similar vein, Ramsey criticizes frameworks that exceptionalize migrants through the lens of crisis or portray their condition of political legal exclusion as a form of protracted in between time through concepts such as liminality. She argues that, and I quote, we deny the coevenness of refugees by describing them as stuck in the present and ignoring the ways in which they share particular temporal rhythms with other people. With these deba debates in mind, the question we posed ourselves in the Wake project was about the epistemological and ethical challenges of studying migration through the chronotope of waiting. Waiting is not a neutral concept, but deeply entangled with modern conceptions about linear time and progress. Notions of waiting often rest on gendered, sexual, class, and racialized norms concerning particular life cycle expectations or expectations of productivity and development. A challenge in the WAIT project thus became how to acknowledge migrants' experiences of having their lives put on hold without reinscribing gendered, sexual, class, and racialized norms. Further concerns related to the extent to which waiting as a temporal lens risk naturalizing migration related differences and nation state borders. Did our focus on irregular migrants as waiting imply that migrants were placed in a different time from us? While unpacking the normative underpinnings of waiting, we engage critically with the suggestion by scholars such as Chagler and Ramsay to turn to the shared temporality between migrants and non-migrants. Both highlight capitalist dispossession and displacement as the starting point for a common analytical lens for recognizing migrants and non-migrants as coeval, although with an equal access to resources and power. Ramsay argues that we appreciate the coevalness across and between the migrant non-migrant binary when we recognize that the time experienced by refugees and other migrants are part of the wider temporal tensions of modern time. That is, when we recognize that both refugees and many citizens share the same future horizons of uncertainty due to global capitalism and neoliberal restructurings. In a chapter that we, that is Christine and I, are currently writing for a different book on transnational analysis in intersectional feminist research, and that we would love to get some feedback on uh, today, we discuss how the critique of denial of coevalness and calls for shared temporality sit alongside understandings of time as multiple and relational. We sympathize with the calls to demigrantize exercise migration studies and to problematize how the temporalizing frames of migration research may contribute to a chronopolitical othering and thereby to reproducing racialized and post-colonial and colonial structures of power. However, rather than foregrounding shared temporalities under neoliberal capitalist modernity, we stress the need to acknowledge how different temporalities are entangled and relationally constituted at the intersection of complex power structures. Speaking about the multiplicity of temporality is not simply about recognizing culturally different ways of thinking about and experiencing time as existing side by side. The frame of multiple and relational time highlights as we see it both the coexistence of multiple time references in everyday life and how these time references are produced and lived within relations of power. It also importantly draws attention to the temporal interdependencies of differently located subjects. By sharing ethnographic expert, excerpts from our field works in um, Oslo and Marseille, 
we wish to complexify the question of shared time as both a question of what it means to share time in ethnographic practice and what it means to produce analytical discourse that recognize uh, the multiplicity and relationality of time. Rather than establishing a common temporal lens for the analysis, we draw on feminist intersectional perspective to argue for greater awareness of how uneven and shifting temporal relations shape knowledge production in migration studies. Through the ethnographic cases, we explore how we are positioned in the always already hierarchical and relational multiplicity of temporalities. Anthropologists who occupy different positions in relation to their interlocutors have offered nuanced ways of thinking about locatedness and geopolitical positionality. For example, anthropology, anthropological studies of migration imply a shift in who is positioned as the native. This has implication for the traditional anthropological axiom of taking the native's point of view. While migrants continue to be construed as attached to spatially different native cultures, this reversal also involves another form of nativism, that of the anthropologist as native. According to Nicolas de Genova, to conduct research related to the migrant non-citizens of a given nation state from the unexamined, unexamined standpoint of the citizens or the native points of view clearly would involve an uncritical ethnocentrism. <clears throat> To apprehend the critical perspectives and lived experience of migrants, the gain of this calls for a systematic effort to formulate an anthropology of migration that makes the researcher's privileged relation to the state as a native and a citizen part of the analysis. While the Genova focuses on how researchers and irregular migrants are positioned differently within the space of the nation state, there is need to further probe the temporal implications of such repositioning. In our analysis of the two ethnographic cases that we will present now, we draw attention to two different dimensions of time that both speak to the question of sharedness and difference. First, the question of sharing of present time as a micropolitics of temporal coordination and secondly, the question of the sharing of present time and its relationship to pastness and futurity. So let me now introduce the first of our two cases, which draws on field notes I wrote after a day of queuing at the Prefecture in Marseille. Anya, a recently divorced woman from Niger in her early 30s, her one-year-old daughter Hannah and I were waiting outside the Prefecture in the chilly morning air. Over the last few months, Anya had been redoing the queue several times. After leaving her abusive husband, Anya had lost her legal right to stay in France. Due to her medical condition, she had gotten a temporary resident permit while she underwent surgery. Now that she was recovering, she was applying for a less precarious residency status, which would allow her to work and thus pay her rent and provide for Hannah. I, a Norwegian researcher doing fieldwork for the WAIT project, was accompanying her, a practice I often engaged in during my many short-term field trips to Marseille. The line to the front desk moved quickly once the prefecture opened. We got ticket number 418. Seated in the waiting area upstairs, we followed attentively the numbers called. After more than an hour, number 400 appeared on the display. At 411, our eyes met in the shared knowledge that it would soon be our turn. Then there was a long pause before the display suddenly jumped to 420. What's happening? Anya asked anxiously. I have no idea. Maybe we should ask, I replied. Maybe, Anya confirmed. Do you want me to do it? I asked. Yes, please, Anya replied. I went over to the door where the 400 numbers were received. A sign said, Please wait until your number or name is called. As the door opened, when the people with ticket number 420 exited, I squeezed in and confronted a row of caseworkers behind glass windows. I approached the caseworker at counter six, asking, what happened to 418? 
We had to do 420 first, she explained, but we will start again at 411 now. There was again a long wait before the numbers on the display started moving. Hannah was crying now. At 417, we got ready to enter. Then it happened again. The display jumped to number 419. Increasingly frustrated, I popped my head in through the door and inquired, what happened to 418? Some papers are lacking, the caseworker answered curtly. How can it take hours to move papers from the ground floor to the first floor, I thought, but did not say it out loud. Another hour passed and we were exhausted from the wait by the time I impatiently latched on to an employee passing by, demanding why it was taking so long for them to call on 418. She went to inquire and came back explaining that they were waiting for a signature now, but it would soon be our turn. After a few minutes, the display showed 418 and we rushed to the counter. Bonjour, we politely ventured. Luckily, not everyone is as annoying as you, madam, the caseworker replied sourly, giving me a hostile stare. I I'm sorry, I mumbled, but Anya, worried that this might go the wrong way, whispered, just leave it. Anya's anxiety in my own tenseness was now palpable. I felt almost, it felt almost like a miracle when the caseworker handed Anya the paper. On our way out, Anya showed me a sign informing that you can be denied access, fined, or arrested if you speak discourteously to caseworkers. It is because of your skin color I let you ask why they skipped her number, you being white and all, Anya explained. She would have treated me way worse. Outside, we stopped to give the paper a closer look and discovered that it was not the one-year residence card that had been issued, only a receipt. She would have to come back to get the actual card. Anya did not seem to mind too much, though. It says here that I can work, she acclaimed happily. For a moment, we remained in this optimistic mood. We got groceries and went back to my place to cook lunch. When it was time for Anya and Hannah to go home, the anxious look returned to Anya's eyes. In a week, the temporary housing she had been given after her surgery would expire and she would have to find a new solution for Hannah and herself. <clears throat> I will now introduce the second case drawing on my field notes um, from um, fieldwork in Oslo. <clears throat> Ruth and I were sitting together at the tram stop occupying the only seats. The stop was quite crowded and more people were constantly arriving. It was rush hour and the tram was almost 20 minutes late due to traffic congestion. When it finally arrived, it was already quite full. Unlike other people at the stop, we did not try to squeeze in. Two minutes later, a new tram arrived, half full, but we did not board. As soon as it drove off, a third tram arrived. This time it was empty. Ruth and I shared a laugh of all the people that squeezed into the first tram who could have had a seat if they had had the patient to wait a few minutes. However, Ruth and I were not going anywhere. We were sitting, mainly quiet, at the stop, watching the three trams pass by again on their return trip with similar pace and the first one full the second half full and the third empty. Ruth was a woman in her 50s, born in Ethiopia and living in Norway without legal residence. I was a majoritized Norwegian citizen in my late 30s doing research for my postdoctoral project. Sitting at the tram stop, Ruth and I were waiting for the weekly soup kitchen for irregular migrants in a church nearby to open. We had met earlier that day at the weekly meeting of People in Limbo, an organization formed by irregular migrants in Oslo, which organized a mixture of political and social activities. Between the two activities, Ruth was letting me hang out with her. Before sitting down at the tram stop, we had been walking around the city, visiting a few shops and shopping malls, looking at clothes on sales without buying anything. Walking around, we mainly small talked about the weather and the things we saw. At one point, Ruth started chiding me for not having kids yet. You mustn't wait, she kept telling me. 
expressing concern that I was too focused on my career. She dismissed my concern regarding a suitable partner, noting that I had a Norwegian passport and a job. Why are you waiting? It will be too late soon. Her chiding surprised me a bit, but questions of children and family were of course issues that I had previously prodded her about. I had first met Ruth in 2012 when I was doing field work for my PhD thesis on migration control and access to healthcare. At that time, Ruth had already been living in Norway for nearly a decade without legal residence. She had no children, nor any family in Norway. During her first year in Norway, she had been able to find regular work as she had been issued a temporary work permit when she first applied for asylum. When the application was rejected, she kept receiving tax card and continued to work. However, in 2010, authorities discovered that tax cards had been issued to irregular migrants due to a system error and immediately put a stop to the practice. Since then, Ruth had not been able to work and lost her apartment. While she generally could sleep at a friend's place, days were often spent walking around the city. After we had walked around for about two hours, I tried to invite Ruth for a cup of tea or coffee so that we could sit down inside somewhere. It was a cold day, just a few degrees Celsius above zero. The rain that had previously been a drizzle was becoming heavier. We get coffee at the soup kitchen. No need to spend your money, Ruth, is, Ruth responded, before suggesting that we sit down at the tram stop, which had a roof protecting us against the rain. After a while, I was starting to feel a bit bored and restless. But Ruth looked tranquil, and I tried to copy her. Now, how can the ethnographic examples of waiting together described help us think through the question of temporal positioning? In which sense did these intersubjective encounters create a common active occupation or sharing of time, as implied by Fabian's notion of coevalness? While we as researchers may occupy the same social space and experience a common location in, say, for instance, calendar time, uh, such as on the autumn in 2017, with our interlocutors, we are in these same situations also calibrated to different temporal itineraries, to use Sarah Sherma's terminology. Recalibration Sharma contends, is about the micropolitics of temporal coordination and social control between multiple temporalities. Expectations to recalibrate time permeate the social fabric differently for distinctive populations. While waiting is a prominent feature of modern everyday life, to the extent that its familiarity and pervasiveness has meant that it's hard to pin down analytically, the request to recalibrate by waiting configured in a broader regime of migration, migration control is ubiquitous for regular migrants and asylum seekers. In the example presented above, queuing at the prefecture was a situational form of waiting to me, while Anya's waiting also had an existential dimension. Anya's future depended on the decision of the prefecture and to some extent on the discretion of the caseworker on whether or not to include her in the futures offered by France and other European nation states to its residents. While I was not a French citizen, the Schengen Agreement of 1985, to which Norway became a signatory in 1996, secured me free movement between European countries. The same agreement fortified the external borders of Europe and reduced Anya's prospects of traveling to and legally staying in France, despite her being born on what was during colonial rule, a part of French territory in so-called French West Africa. The geopolitical bordering of Europe has consequences for positioning in terms of citizenship and racialization. As Didier Fassin has argued, the external border of the French nation state are deeply interlinked with internal borders produced by colonization and racialization. While neither I nor Anya were French citizens, I, unlike Anya and other people from, French, from former French territories, was not migrantized. 
that is perceived as a migrant. This also has a temporal dimension. Anya pointed out how the impatience of racialized black bodies risked being perceived and sanctioned as uncourteous behavior. The way in which Anya and I were differently racialized as African and black and as European and white created different subject positions across which the possibility to display impatience, voice protest, and the expectation to fair treatment, as well as affects, were differentially distributed. Thus, even if waiting may be perceived as an active occupation and sharing of present time, the two ethnographic examples we suggest illustrate how both socioeconomic and racial positioning condition the effective experience of waiting and the possibility to curtail boredom, display impatient, voice protest, or demand fair treatment. To be co-temporaneous, co to actively occupy or share time, concerns more than the question of rhythm, tempo, and duration of time, though. Johannes Fab Fabian argued in Time and the Other that to be knowingly in each other's present, we must somehow be able to share each other's past. Sharing each other's past does not mean that they need to be identical, but the way Kevin Berth reads it, that sufficient common knowledge about the past is shared to make communication in the present intelligible. Marianne and I both knew Ruth and Anya from previous fieldworks at the time the situations described above took place. Multiple conversations and time spent together have thus to some extent facilitated shared temporal frameworks necessary for intersubjective communication. However, there were also many aspects of Ruth and Anya's past to which we had access only through their narratives, notably the pasts they shared with people in the communities from which they migrated and with other migrants crossing borders. But occupying a shared present is not only conditioned by pasts, it may as well involve horizons of expectation and the question of futures. In some nativist anti-immigration discourses, the future of Marianne and I as citizens or citizens of Europe is relationally constituted in opposition to that of migrants. In the case of Ruth and Marianne, we see how such discourses differently configure the question of reproduction reproductive futurities. As the case shows, both Marianne and Ruth, as childless women of a certain age, were affected by gendered expectations of a successful life course. However, in nativist and anti-immigration discourses, both in Norway and in France, the futurities represented by their potential childbearing was not the same. In such discourses, the reproductive reproductivity of migrants are sometimes construed as a threat to the future of natives, whereas low reproductive numbers among majoritized and in particular affluent and educated women is cast as a problem for the future of the nation. Our ethnographic cases, we argue, highlight some of the dilemmas that questions of temporal sharedness and difference raise for knowledge production in migration studies. However, before concluding, let us also consider another temporal framework that is highly relevant at the moment and that potentially encompasses such differentiations in rhythm and temporal coordination, as well as in future orientations. The COVID-19 pandemic and the economic crisis energized by efforts to combat it has generalized the experience of an uncertain future to ever broader parts of the global population. Countries around the world have been declaring a state of emergency in response to the pandemic. People have been confined and their everyday lives are being suspended. With the emergency, suspension and confinement came a complexity of forms of waiting. People were waiting for a notified disaster, for their loved ones to return safely, for the end of their quarantine, or for that little cough, an embodied reminder of the pandemic to pass. And these days, people around the globe are waiting for vaccines to come their way and for the reopening of society, as it is often called. While conceptualizations of shared existential waiting can destabilize neat petitions between citizens and migrants, 
applying a shared temporal framework, say of neoliberal restructuring uh, that Ramsey and Kaglari calls for, or of pandemic emergency, also risks obscuring important differences by falling back on presumptions of a higher historical temporal totality or generalized social reality. With regard to the pandemic, the last year has shown how it exacerbates intersecting social differences and hierarchies. Many irregular migrants, for instance, are not included in national health schemes and live under conditions that expose them disproportionately to the virus. This also has a temporal dimension. Many people have long inhabited a present defined through its relation to an uncertain and suspended future. For many irregular migrants, waiting is a context of their lives rather than an episodic rupture or delimited temporal region. The assumption of a return to a normal state of life after the pandemic overlooks the extent to which temporal conditions such as prolonged states of emergency related to disease or war or chronic waiting are part and parcel of many people's lives around the globe. In conclusion, we argue for a geopolitical positioning in research, which rather than insisting on temporal sharedness as a foundation of coevalness, acknowledges different temporal situatedness, as well as the multiple experiences and the lines of time and history that operate within the present. A call for recognizing the multiplicity and relationality of times in the present does not decenter in and of itself forms of normative temporalities that create hierarchies, however. Recognizing and reflecting on the interdependency of differential lived time and how time as space is always already intersecting form of social difference is hardly a new feminist tool. And that is uh, what we're trying to develop in this book that we're contributing to with our chapter. However, we believe it can inspire further reflections on the meaning of geopolitical and chronopolitical locations and positionings in migration studies. Fantastic. Um, thank you so much, Christine Jakobsen, Marianne Carlson. We're now going to hear a response from Samra Asmir. Um, thank you. Thank you so much for this wonderful paper. I'm going to try to keep my remarks really brief so that we can have time for discussion. Um, one of the major preoccupations of this quite sensitive paper about migration and that imperiality on politics of endless wait, the endless waiting of migrants and refugees is how to write and to write about this temporality of waiting without turning it into a marker of the other or without having it do the work of othering. In Anne-Marie and Christine's argument, nativist anti-immigration discourses other or make other migrants and refugees by temporally distancing them from citizens. This temporal othering is accomplished in one example when migrants and refugees are made to are associated with the past because they arrive from the global south itself marked by temporal otherness migrants too are relegated to the past and in this relegation they are posited against a modern and therefore future oriented western citizen. But there is also another temporal experience that distinguishes migrants from and refugees that this piece is, is interested in and wait and focused on, and that is waiting. Here we are presented with waiting as saturating migrant conditions of life. Waiting, one might say, is a key constitutive temporal condition of migrant and refugee lives. Waiting in line, waiting for food, waiting for a permit, waiting for a legal paper, waiting without constantly filling up the present. Migrants find themselves in conditions of prolonged waiting, a waiting that is neither really past nor present nor future. A waiting hood, they call it in the, in the larger project that is produced by law, the social organization of time, as well as the migrants own encounter with the temporal conditions of prolonged waiting. At issue, therefore, is also at issue as well as also the cultivation of subjects who have learned to wait anxious, anx in an anxious or patient way or both. 
How to understand this waiting? Does the focus on waiting risk producing temporal others insofar as migrants in their, make, in their waiting begin to lack a future, a future that citizens continue to hold on to? Does waiting mark them as figures stuck in the present and failing to orient themselves to a future? Or might it be that under conditions of global capital, waiting is the experience, the shared experience of citizens, not only of refugees and migrants. That is to say, might waiting be a temporal experience shared by both citizens and migrants in that they both share an orientation to a future as uncertain. And most importantly, perhaps, how to write about this waiting without it becoming, without waiting, becoming an othering analytic. What genres and styles of ethnographic writing are available that could at once register the distinctiveness of waiting among migrants without rendering them other? I take these to be the questions that animate the paper that um, Christine, the chapter that Christine and Marianne present today. To be sure, however, another key preoccupation of the paper is how writing about the ethnographic encounters with migrants could resist, the very act of writing, could resist the temporal othering of the migrants. The migrants. So the inquiry is at once about the temporal experience of migrants, but at the same time, it is about the ethnographer and the writing itself. So their inquiry is, 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 is focused on writing and more specifically as they write, quote, what it means to produce an anthropological discourse that recognizes the multiplicity and relationality of time, end quote, including that of the ethnographer or the researcher. The power of the ethnographic field notes and their analysis is that the writing is that they bring the ethnographer back into a shared time with the migrant, but also, this, their writing points out that the time they share is somewhat out of sync. These are not the words Christine and Anne Marie use, but these are my words. And my questions will be more or less about the possibility of thinking this out of syncness, if you will. Um, so that, and, and to really depart from Fabian's shared time altogether. So this is what I'm gonna try to think with you about. So I have four questions and they're all moving in this orbit. As we read the ethnographic field notes, which they read for us today, we get the sense that was, there was sharing of waiting. It's the same calendar, autumn 2017, but, this sharing, but there was also sharing of events. There was so much going on between the ethnographer and the migrant, the ethnographers and the migrants. Um, but still there is the sense at least to me, for me as a reader, that the sharing rests, rests not only on multiplicity of temporalities, which is your language, but difference. That is to say, and I don't think multiplicity of temporality equals difference. That is to say that your paper does not complexify sharing, does not only complexify sharing, does not only offer us plural temporalities that are the result of racialized order of things, um, in your paper, there is something else in the field notes and your analysis of the field notes, there is something else that I, I sensed, I thought was going on. Um, I kept wondering uh, whether that waiting, sharing waiting and not sharing it indexes, indexes another temporality and um, which is equally at play, at play. And that is um, the experience of endurance. One gets the sense that these women are not waiting. These women are enduring. They're not only waiting, they are enduring. Enduring illegal and political and a bureaucratic system, obviously. And enduring is not exactly waiting. Enduring is an act of struggle, but also of survival, of survival, but also of struggle. So if we bracket waiting as an organizing analytic, and think endurance, would we even remain within a shared temporal experience as uneven as an, and as plural as it might be? 
would we not enter the realm of difference at this point? So that's my first question. My second question um, has to do with, Jamil, um, this is really something that I'm, I'm just curious about, and I know you would have some interesting insights to share. Why do you think there is a desire to register chair time beyond this desire being a response to the nativist anti-immigration policies that other migrants and refugees? You acknowledge that the space sharing obviously could be an imposition of hegemonic forces. But beyond that, um, if difference is not necessarily othering, why not maintain it, reflect it, dwell on it, rather than overcome it in writing? Not that you do that. I'm just asking more generally about that, that move to insist on shared time. So rather than shared time in Fabian's terms, why not solidarity, which ensues from the grounds of difference, which is actually what I read in your paper. That is what I was reading in the field notes and analysis in your paper. My third question, you write, and I quote, the cases does illustrate the need to couple a focus on shared insecurity created by neoliberal restructuring with a careful analysis of the temporal specificities of different modes of precarity and how these are configured differently at the intersection of class, gender, sexuality, citizenship, and racialization, end quote. I think I, I'm, the question that I kept thinking about, what remains of shared in your work? Really, is this ultimately, what, what is then, what remains of shared? Um, and again, not in the Fabian, I mean, if it's the Fabian terms, I get that, but is in your work, what remains of the shared? Finally, and then this is about, temporality and not only temporality of waiting, might the preoccupation with the colonial and post-colonial constitution of difference as hierarchical, including temporal difference as hierarchical, or might the political desire to disrupt, uh, to respond to anti-immigration discourses prevent us uh, from coming to terms with difference what it means to wait or to endure. And if we accept that waiting is the opposite of speed, then might the waiting of migrants or the ways in which they learn to cultivate it in Europe has to do also with their past experiences of time and of the movement of time. This is not an invitation for a culturalist argument, obviously, but an argument that seeks to see or seeks to investigate how temporal sensibilities are cultivated under different circumstances and are inherited also across time. They persist, they remain, and they also guide us in new places. So it's a question about past temporalities that migrants bring with them and how they're de redeployed in the new temporality of waiting. So to really take temporality seriously and to take your non-linear approach to time seriously might require that we also think about their own past temporality or experiences of time or temporal sensibilities. But thank you so much. Fantastic. Um, so I'm going to ask uh, Christine and Marianne to respond uh, to, Samra's comments, but also say I can actually see who's attending the webinar. They're amazing scholars. <laughs> uh, also on the webinar um, participation as attendees, and I really encourage you to put comments or questions in the Q&A um, for any of our uh, speakers. So let me turn it back to Christine and Marianne and ask if you have any initial reactions to what Samra just said. Do you want to go first, Christina, or? 
Well, thank you so much, uh, Samira. Uh, you're a, a, such an amazing reader, uh, and uh, thank you so much for for your feedback and reading and for these very incisive uh, questions. I'm not sure we're uh, going to be able to do them justice, but um, let's let's just try and and have some reflections around them. Uh, I think um, the question of uh, us using waiting as a sort of an organizing analytic concept here, uh, rather than, um, for instance, endurance uh, or other concepts, is um, meant in a sense to um, be sort of an analytics that allows us to unpack various um, um, temporal engagements that not would not necessarily fall under a concept of waiting. So uh, uh, we're talking about different forms of of uh, stockedness, of being out of sync, of uh, endurance, of patience, etc., and trying to unpack those, but in relation to that sort of overall uptick of waiting. And this is something that we discuss a lot in our project, whether we sort of limited ourselves by having waiting as that sort of central analytic gaze. But I wanted, Marianne, maybe you could say something because you wrote a paper on the the notion of endurance. I mean, I, we also have been thinking about, uh, for me in the French concept, the, the context that the, the notion of patience is very central because in French you say patiente when you want people to wait. And then on the other hand, there is also different uh, words for waiting in the different languages that our interlocutors speak. So, for instance, to me, it's very interesting the concept of sabr in Arabic, which has a sort of a um, um, notion of endurance to it as well, but it's related to the Islamic tradition. But Marianne, maybe you could say something about how you think about endurance. Yes, um, it, it was interesting. You, you sort of uh, pointed out this um, notion of endurance and to what extent and how it's different from waiting. Um, in my chapter in the weight book, uh, I work with the concept of endurance, drawing among other on Kassan Haag's work, where he used the notion of waiting out uh, as a form of endurance. Um, and, and also the sort of duality in this concept that it's both a form of can be he approached as a form of governmentality of sort of disciplining people to wait well, and also um, as creating a space for other ways of of being or living and 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 I tried to sort of prod this this duality um, <clears throat> in relation to Ruth uh, and other women uh, that I met during my field work that were so called long staying rejected asylum seekers in Norway, people who had lived for 10 to 20 years in Norway in uh, a very marginalized situation as um, with very limited access to, to work and, uh, and how they sort of um, tried to create a community and, and other ways of, of um, filling their, their sort of days with meaning and the struggle they had to do that by using the concept of endurance, but also seeing how waiting out the condition of illegality also can work as uh, um, what you call um, the cultivating particular subjectivities. You questioned that about whether we then enter into the realm of difference. And, and I, I'm not uh, quite ready to answer. I think I need to think about it. Um, yeah. Uh, I th uh, another of your question, what remained of shared it is a good question. We were just asking us, uh, it, did we in our attempt to sort of problematize shared temporalities, um, take out the sh anything that was shared in these contexts. But I think our point and where we draw on a lot of feminist um, scholars is precisely that we need to understand sharedness also as a, as a recognition of uh, what also uh, is difference here in these this, uh, particular situations. What, what's the sort of how we are differently positioned in this situation is a way of, of uh, creating sharedness in another sense. 
Thank you. I, I, I think you're pointing very rightly to sort of a, a tension um, in our thinking in the chapter, because our point of departure are these calls for co-evilness and for shared temporal frameworks. And in the sense that has been the prevalent critique within migration studies. So we start from that critique in a sense, and that's where we're thinking from. And that's why it may seem that we're sort of still holding on to this uh, sharedness and maybe also even as a sort of a, uh, a normative, you know, way of thinking that we should, that there should be sharedness. And we were, I think we're, um, purposefully unclear in the sense that we don't want to maintain co-evilness as, as the sort of given ideal that we should strive to in the sense of shared time, but we just want to unpack it and explode it, but without moving in the direction that you say to think more fully about difference and uh, thinking uh, temporal multiplicity and relationality from the point, uh, starting point of difference, which we, we could have done. And maybe that will be our next paper. So I would love to read a question that just came in from Debarati Sanyal. Hello, Marianne, Christine, Samra, and Letty. Christina, Samra, and Letty, what an amazing conversation. Following up on Samra's comments, in light of Christina's evocation of Anya's status as someone issuing from former French territories versus Christina as someone who can move freely in Europe, I'm wondering if you could speak a bit to some of your interviewees own sense of complex historical, memorial and political temporalities, including their own sense of the time of the future, their future, if that makes sense. Mm, yeah, it makes sense. Uh, thank you, that's a, a wonderful question. And it, it's a big question also that I, I cannot do justice to here. What I think is interesting um, in my material and when speaking to uh, my interlocutors is the sort of uh, complexity of these um, um, temporal histories of, of positioning in relation to France and that has shifted over time. So for instance, some of my um, Algerian interlocutors are born in France uh, and yet they have been irregularized as uh, illegal foreigners in France at a later point. So these sort of very complex uh, histories of, of coloniality also still unfolding in some territories. So some of the irregularized migrants also being from what are currently now also named as French territories. So how do how people bring these sort of um, the, the, the subjectivities and self understanding that comes from this sort of shifting and conflictual and, and very complicated relationship to French territory and what it means to be French. That's something I'm trying to write about and think about uh, in my forthcoming book, but I don't think I could sort of um, lay that out here for you in a short answer, but thank you very much for that question. Marianne, do you want to add anything to this? No? Okay. Um, can I ask, so you, you talk about waiting um, and uncertain futures. And in thinking about that, it made me think about, well, are there certain futures, right? In the, in the sense that does waiting always imply an uncertain future? And if so, why the modifier uncertain in front of future? In other words, are there, is perhaps part of what is going on with this shared coevalness, but actual difference between the ethnographer and the migrant that you have a certain future or you, you have the capacity of imagining a certain future and they do not. Um, so just interested to hear your thoughts on that. a good question um, um well, well, yeah I, I think you touched upon it in the sense that um who's allowed to imagine or include it in the future uh, <laughs> as much as whether it's sort of the personal perspective in the part of the paper we didn't um present we we are sort of i'm i'm just uh, juxtaposing my position as a precarious um 
academic uh, or academic in a precarious situation if my uncertain future how does it relate to my interlocutors uncertain future and of course you can say it's it's a different form of uncertainty as well because it's or or, or if you say degrees or of, of certainty but it, I, I do and I think part of my struggle with with some of these suggestions of, of Ramsa and, and, and Chagler is that it generalizes, um, I think, or, or it risks that you end up generalizing uh, too much a, a general condition uh, instead of also see that it is shaped differently because of how different power uh, structures uh, intersect in these situations. So my form of uncertainty is not not necessarily <laughs> comparable uh, in this sense. And, and, and I, yeah, the uneasiness with that. But of course, this is a question, do we need uncertain in front of futures as they are uncertain in the sense for us all? Yeah. Christina, do you want to add? Yeah, I think it's, it's a very interesting question. And it's sort of one of the things that some of the authors in the book try to unpack a little bit more. So what what it, how can we understand waiting as a, a relationship um, to the future uh, uh, as a particular kind of relationship um, to to futures or to futurity? And there are different ways uh, of thinking about this in the literature and there are different ways in which people experience this sort of um, and I think that uh, in a, yeah in a certain sense there is a of course an, an openness um, in uh, um, the concept of waiting that could mean both sort of risk and potentiality uh, in relationship to to the future but it's as Marianne says uh, that is also differently distributed uh, in the sense that uh, there are some certainties, some uh, frameworks that um, one may take from, for granted from a, a privileged position in the sense that one just assumes that it will continue to be that way. And I think that's one of the things that's also been thrown into uh, relief now with the, with the COVID pandemic, where precisely sort of that feeling of that certainty uh, ceasing uh, to be there also for people who otherwise may experience the world in, in that way. Thank you all so much. We're at time, so we're gonna end our session, but a huge thanks to Christina Jakobsen, Marianne Carlson, Samra Esmir for a really fantastic discussion. Looking forward to seeing you all in some uncertain future, hopefully in the same physical space. Thank you. Take care, everybody. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.